Hi, all of you wonderful scuba divers out there. Welcome to the Scuba Diver Magazine podcast, which this week is sponsored by Scuba Pro, who are celebrating their 60th year of being an iconic scuba diving brand. And Scuba Pro has a few offers that I'm going to break down later on in this podcast, so stay tuned for that. Uh, this week, we have an account of one of the divers who was on board the Carlton Queen liverboard that capsized in the Red Sea and the company's response, as well as a diver who was deported from Thailand two years ago. He's now facing criminal charges for a video that he uploaded to YouTube. Uh, and also, I saw a new one that uh, hammerhead sharks can hold their breath, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, this is quite a um, an interesting one. This popped up on Diver Net, and scuba divers on the Red Sea liverboard, the Carlton Queen, which capsized in late April, view the incident and its aftermath rather differently to the way the operator is um, claiming things happened. So, one UK diver has spoken to Divernet and they explain how he and the others escaped a dramatically reorientated saloon, uh, as well as how others had to free dive out of where they were and why arguments flared back on dry land whilst the Carlton fleet um, provides its, its own perspective uh, after all the events. So, this was a, uh, a UK-based scuba diver who's spent a lot of time around boats. And they're a Paddy IDC staff instructor at Academy Divers in West Yorkshire. Um, and, of course, being a, a British diver who's dived the Red Sea many, many times, it's quite a, uh, a popular dive site for us. Uh, or at least a dive location, I should say. I've been there many times myself. And... Um, He's a self-confessed self diving addict. And um, yeah, the, the way that he puts it is, on Saturday the 22nd of April, uh, he and his wife had been back in Egypt with a group of friends revolving around a, a Spanish dive center. They were on a similar northern itinerary to when they were in, uh, in Egypt in February. But this time on a liverboard promoted by an operator, Carlton Fleet Red Sea, um, as b having been built in 2022. So there, there's a little asterisk next to that, which I'll get back to later. But it's effectively it's it's a new vessel. Um, in fact, it was. It seems that it's not a new vessel, but an enlarged version of the Carlton Queen that had been operating in the Red Sea for some 20 years already. So it was more refurbished in 2022, or like it, it had an extension. Yeah. Um, so since its recent emergence from dry dock, it had been out only once, uh, which was carrying kite surfers the week before this trip. And Hansen had in fact sailed with the Carlton fleet before in 2022 at the suggestion of another member of the group. Although I'm learning that the Carlton Queen had gone in for a refit, they'd been assigned to another liverboard called the Life Story. All went well for the friends, um, so they booked the, uh, the April 2023 charter. The 42 meter long Carlton Queen was built to accommodate 28 guests with six double cabins above and eight below decks. The previous incarnation of the liverboard had been advertised as a six meters shorter. So they've extended it uh, and it had capacity for only 22 guests in 11 cabins. So they just yeah, extended it, added some, um, some cabins and 26 guests had booked on for this trip, joining a crew of nine as well as three dive guides. Now, they boarded the uh, the Carlton Queen in Haggadah on Saturday the 22nd of April, and they say that they immediately spotted that the boat was listing a couple of degrees to the starboard side. Um, they also noted that the saloon doors leading from the dive deck opened outwards. A dive briefing was held that night, which they say was unusual. In fact, it was their first ever night briefing on arrival day. The, the session included the location of the escape hatch for the lower deck cabins, uh, which will be important later, where to find life vests and other safety information. The starboard tilt came up 
and was mentioned and was explained as being connected with taking on water in the tanks and the boat needed some time to settle. So everything's normal. Don't worry, the boat's just listing to one side. It's normal. On moving off the following day, however, they estimate that the list had become more pronounced, somewhere between five and seven degrees, they, uh, they estimate. Uh, but the captain cited that the water tanks and said that as it was a new boat, it needed to soak up water to sit straight. Three dives were carried out, but the list remained. And when the diver woke up at about 4 a.m. on the following Monday for an early dive, he believed that the list had reached between 20 and 30 degrees. So it's getting very, very noticeable at this point. And this time the captain put it down to unbalanced use of the bathrooms. The tilt then overcorrected to 5 degrees to the port side. So it swung all the way to the other side. And... And the diver who was talking to uh, to dive in it said, I remember saying to the dive guide that I hope the captain takes it nice and steady across the strait, as I believe the boat might have some stability issues with the ballast, um, which clearly did. He believed that the keel is going to be too shallow for such a tall boat, but like other guests, a number of whom held yachting licenses, uh, he couldn't believe that the captain, who purported to own this boat, would risk it and the lives of those on board. Clearly there was an issue, but it was obviously manageable because he'd been able to correct the heave, says this diver. After the breakfast, Carlton Queen left um, where they were heading for Ras Mohammed. Hanson was sitting in the saloon chatting with two other guests, a female dive master and a male master instructor. On encountering the swell at the Strait of Gabal, he says that he saw chairs suddenly shift to the starboard before the boat stabilised pretty quickly quoted. Then the boat swayed to the port side significantly, then swayed a long way starboard. So it's going left and right and left and right. And he shouted warning to others in the saloon to lift their legs as tables literally slid across the laminate flooring and smashed into the sofas where they were sitting, uh, which was to the starboard near the saloon doors. They go on to say the boat heaved violently, violently to port and that was it. It tipped all the way to starboard and we were catapulted off the chairs and onto the windows. We're now standing on the windows looking up at an almost vertical climb to the closed saloon doors. My immediate thought was that this was the thing that was going to kill us. I remember shouting that we had to wait. I could see that the sofa immediately above our heads was still moving and pulling away from the wall. Still quoting, they say, I'm not tall. Uh, I needed something to climb onto to reach those doors. At this point, the other two divers were already trying to climb the furniture to get to the saloon doors. Water was jetting through gaps around the windows that we were standing on. It was only a matter of time before they gave way, the diver says. Then the boat shifted again. It actually released the sofa from directly above the diver's head. So the sofa's falling from the now ceiling and actually knocked um, the others back down onto the windows. And from below decks, they could hear the cries of two of their fellow guests who were a father and son amid smashing and crashing everywhere and tanks clattering. Now, there's no way of reaching anyone below with the stairs now being eight meters above the three divers' heads and a vertical climb away on a slippery floor so that there's no way they could get up to go below deck, if that makes sense, because everything's now on its side. Fortunately, the two sofas had now combined to form a platform that they could step onto and the, those three divers managed to climb the kind of hessian backing, hoist themselves up and then leap onto a nearby cupboard that was near to the saloon door. He bumped his head in the process and he could now see through the salon door uh, and knew he would need to smash through the tempered glass to be able to get through the doors. The water line was now about three meters below him, with the boat pitching bow first, engine still running, the cupboard on which he was still perched was tilting dangerously. So he swung backwards and forwards on the door handles to build momentum and succeeded to shatter and break through the glass. And whilst he straddled the door frame, 
The master instructor was able to climb over him and onto the cupboard before leaning over and attempting to lift the dive master and, um, and they, they sort of helped them onto the cupboards to get out. Once out, they uh, they swam for it over the dive deck, uh, making for one of the liverboard's two ribs, uh, which he could already see his wife was sitting on board, so he knew that she was safe. They say that the rib did a man overboard turn, and they say that I was pinned between that and the life raft. Uh, I elbowed them apart and jumped in, dragged the final way in by my shorts. And he notes that the Cult and Queen's captain uh, was already on the life raft. Apart from the ribs, Cult and Queen carried two 20-person life rafts. The captain had launched one of these and the other one uh, was deployed. He, this is where the, uh, the accounts kind of differ because this diver said that the second life raft was deployed automatically. Uh, it actually inverted and then was swept away. So practically useless. Um, according to the witness who was on the fly deck when the cult and queen had turned over, one rib had crushed the other rib and the one that was now in use had eventually flipped out with a, um, uh, with a deflated stern, leaving the other one wedged below the liverboard. One fellow guest was shaking, clearly in shock. Uh, so divers attended to her. Um, his wife joined him on the life raft. People were shouting and attempting to do a head count as the raft started filling up with people very fast. And according to him, it appeared to be that the guests organising the rescue at this point instead of staff members. Galley staff and some deckhands were hanging off the side and the back of the life raft, some of them praying. Uh, two of the three dive guides were occupied trying to help their crewmates. The third guide, he says, was in complete shock, having been trapped for a time in his cabin by the water pressure and quoted saying that he had to free dive out through an inrush of water uh, not an easy thing to get over so he just sat in the life raft and just looked into space and he was of no use to anyone having to escape his cabin because the water was holding his door shut he had to push through that and then swim into the um, uh, into the water to be able to get out of the liverboard um, apparently the captain told us not to use the flares but we had a cargo container ship barreling down on us the parachute day flares the captain had tried to stop them using failed to work, apparently, but they did succeed in firing handheld flares. The cargo vessel signalled a change of course and stopped. Um, we had over 30 people in one single life raft at one point, and that wasn't stable. It's the 20 people life rafts, uh, so there's just too many people, and it's fortunate they say that the uh, the VIP Shrook 2 um, had ribs, that's, so that's another liverboard who was in the area, uh, or another dive vessel at least, um, arrived to evacuate us. And the diving liverboard that's, um, that run the VIP Shrook out of uh, Sharm El Sheikh, fortunately was in the vicinity and carried the Carlton Queen's guests and crew to safety. Uh, they treated them for shock, gave them warm clothes, food and drink, and the, uh, the VIP Shrook's crew were later commended for their prompt action by Egypt's Chamber of Diving and Water Sports. So one of the other guests who was talking to this diver who's spoken to Divernet um, said that one of the others told him that he had been with the captain when the cult and queen capsized and said that he had actually turned the boat away from a wave before proceeding to launch and, uh, and board the life raft. So... Another guest, a uh, trainee rib driver, claimed that the captain had been aggressively, quote, uh, aggressively trying to cut the waves. Uh, she had told her father that the boat would overturn only seconds before it actually did. Her mother, the only non-diver on board, had fallen into the water from the fly deck, so they're right up top as it capsized and uh, managed to go in straight into the water. The father and son, who had been heard below decks, boarded the, uh, the VIP Shrook in shock, uh, reporting that the only other guest who had been 
down below decks with them was still missing. Uh, they said that when Carlton Queen turned over, they had gone to the cabin where, according to the initial briefing, the safety hatch was supposed to be, only to discover that although it was marked emergency hatch, it was actually a false door with neither hinges nor handles. So that's very worrying. Uh, the father had been injured by a tank falling from the saloon, uh, but his son had managed to drag him out with the help of the now missing guest who had told them to go ahead without them. All the son could do to, uh, to help him was to pass him down an air tank. I presume to look for any other divers. The, um, the man had waited in darkness in the cabins below the saloon there had been no safety lights working, um, and once they'd filled with water, he was able to then free dive out through the saloon. Oh, so actually, he was trapped um, and, and couldn't get up to get out, so had to wait for the water level to rise before he could swim out. And because that took some time, the um, by the time that he got clear, the lifeboats were almost a mile away. So he just stayed with the liverboard and was fortunately spotted waving by the uh, the container ship's crew. Um, just literally sat on board the um, uh, the side of the um, the Carlton Queen, just waving for help. The diver claims that the captain didn't know how many guests were on board the boat and gave the wrong number to the captain of the VRP Shrook. Um, he did take a rib back to try and find their passports, but on his return he couldn't get into one of the guest cabins, uh, so they had lost absolutely everything on board. No passports, anything. Um, all they had with them was literally what they were wearing. Um, when the uh, when the boat capsized. After two hours, the group were transferred by a fast army patrol boat to Hagada. Uh, Carlton Fleet had sent a coach to take them to an all-inclusive hotel. Unfortunately, apparently they w didn't have separate rooms. Um, they had three shares. The um, uh, this diver and his wife had one of the better rooms, which had a king-size double, uh, one of the only ones that didn't have bugs in it, unfortunately. Um, the hotel was hosting a wedding for locals, so they had to endure an eight-hour-long song fest of uh, Egyptian techno rock, and the bass was shaking the buildings until midnight. They couldn't eat the food. Um, one of them had... Um, rather upset stomach after having a, um, a stuffed pepper and the CWS inspector who interviewed them said that where they took them was not a tourist hotel just very very cheap and um, and what they describe is a huge argument with um, one of the uh, the dive instructors and administrators at Carlton Fleet and the, the guests arranged to be upgraded to a four-star hotel on the understanding that the operator would cover the cost. And I've had a, a similar experience out there, not with Colton Fleet, um, but yeah, where you have a conversation and uh, and you agree that they're going to cover the cost. And then later on, they turn around and say, oh, no, I, I never agree to that. That was a completely separate thing. It's just reading this. It's um, yeah, quite, quite a similar experience. Um, so, of course, the, um, the company disputes this version of events, uh, including the claim that the initial hotel, the Sand Beach Resort, was not a tourist hotel. Um, quoted, the, the company arranged a four-star resort, the all-inclusive La Rosa Waves Beach, uh, which would have been higher in cost than the hotel the group leader wanted to be accommodated in, they told Diver Net. Um, and she also denies that there had been any arguments uh, about the move. Quoted, I only told the group leader that the company would move them immediately to La Rosa if they wished, uh, which was denied, so the guests were brought to the hotel they had requested. Without passports, everything became complex, the original diver says. Uh, we needed police reports and lots of money to buy emergency travel documents and the paperwork and photographs for the visa reissue. Fortunately, the locals of the area, seeing the reports on TV, all came together and offered us free clothes, arranged medication, and were truly wonderful and helpful. The boat company, on the other hand, was just abusive. Uh, this is 
a, a quote I'm still reading, uh, and wanted to get rid of us as fast as humanly possible. When they discovered that the lack of passports was a major hindrance to us boarding a plane the day after, they lawyered up. Um, Carlton Fleet wanted the guests to use their own dive and travel insurance to cover whatever they needed, apparently, says the uh, the diver. But as many of us found out to our insurance companies, this sounded a lot like something the boat's insurance needed to pay, which makes sense. Um, the divers had been covered by Carlton Fleet for the equivalent of £1,250, they claim. So just getting the coach and the hotel was already impacting their bottom line, apparently. Um, so after this, Divernet asked Carlton Fleet Red Sea about the allegations of the uh, the guests about the state of the boat in the early stages of the trip, the evacuation procedures, their treatments once rescued, and whether the boat had been quote, new or not. And they um, and the operator said, while we are deeply saddened about the accidents, we are relieved by the safe return of all guests and crew members to shore. The Egyptian authorities are currently investigating the incident and our staff members and crew are cooperating with them to identify the reasons for the boat capsizing. We will abstain from making statements regarding the cause of the accident until the conclusion of the investigation to avoid misleading the readers. The Carlton Fleet team emphasises that Carlton Queen, which was recently renovated, had undergone all required maintenance works, passed all inspections and was fit for operations as confirmed by technical reports. Secondly, the Carlton Fleet team finds itself compelled to address, albeit briefly, some of the ill-founded reports made with respect to the crew members' handling of the guests, both at the time of the accident and until their return to their home countries. The safe return of all of those on board bears testament to the crew members' effective management of the situation, which spared the lives of all passengers. Fortunately, and notwithstanding, any sensationalist allegations made by some dis- disgruntled guests, only three divers sustained minor injuries that were treated in hospital at the company's expense. Carlton Queen's crew members followed the safety protocols applicable to the circumstances, leading to the swift evacuation of the boat. The captain fired six flares in the air immediately upon the occurrence of the accident, which alerted a cargo ship to the need for help, prompting it to change its course and secure the area. It is confirmed that the life rafts were released by the captain and another crew member who ensured that the raft remained close to the boat, notwithstanding strong wind and current until all passengers could board them with the crew's assistance, except that one guy who was left down below and the life raft that just seemed to blow away upside down. Um, Continuing the uh, the quote, immediately upon reaching the shore, the members of Carlton Fleet escorted the guests to a hotel and provided them with clothing and any pharmaceutical products they required. The following day, to guarantee their comfort, all the guests were transferred to an all-inclusive hotel of their choice. We communicated directly with the British consul to assist English guests with the issuance of new travel documents to replace those that were lost whilst the guests remained in the hotel. We also wrote to all the embassies of the other guest nationalities to procure their assistance. Uh, The German guests were driven to Cairo to receive the necessary documents there, after which they were driven by the pyramids upon their request. Most of the guests travelled back to their countries on the 29th of April 2023, Those that were compelled to remain in Egypt until new travel documents were issued were lodged by the Carlton Fleet family in the same hotel they had chosen until their safe return to their families. Besides the company's coverage of all medical accommodation and all other expenses relating to guests, including pocket money, new travel document fees and flight changes, the team offered to pay the guests additional amounts for inconvenience before the conclusion of the investigation. Unfortunately, the company's offer fell on deaf ears and certain guests engaged in negotiation tactics and resorted to threats to strong arm the Carlton fleet into paying them larger amounts, notwithstanding their signature of releases and liability waivers and the charter's clear instructions that they procure insurance for loss or damage to equipment and belongings prior to boarding the boat. 
the threats regrettably persisted following their safe return to their home countries. At last, we are cooperating with the Egyptian authorities to determine the cause of the accident and urge all those concerned to wait for the result of the investigation that we may determine the next steps. So, oof, that's a uh, tough one. And, um, yeah, the the ones that, that get me is the... Uh, the the emergency hatch that wasn't an emergency hatch, even though it was labelled up as yeah an escape hatch, uh, it it didn't have hinges, um, and yeah just the fact that everything's normal. This is normal, even though it's listing like twenty to thirty degrees to one side, and then it lists over to the other side. Um, yeah, luckily this had a, a happy outcome. I mean, I say happy. Um, at least everyone got out and survived uh yeah but this if this had happened like in the middle of the night when everyone was below deck it's truth this, this is a rough one so um yeah we will uh, we'll keep our eyes on uh, on this one and uh, and see how this is going to affect the um uh, i don't know safety ratings or at least the um uh the like safety requirements because it had literally been tested and signed off the same month that they had been on this liveaboard. So, um, yeah, whoever signed it off either missed something substantial or it just wasn't included in their requirements. So, uh, yeah, no, it's true. this is just a dangerous one. But so, um, huh, um, yeah, keep, keep an eye out. If there are any updates, um, then I'll... Um, I'll let you, uh, you wonderful divers, know. But um, it's true, yeah. Next time you go on the liverboard and it's it's listing over to one side, um, yeah, kick kick up a bit of a fuss and um, and don't take. Oh no, it just needs to settle out. Um, yeah, as as an excuse. So the next news story is a, a bit of a warning, actually, for anyone diving around Thailand, uh, especially with a camera because a, uh, a Hungarian scuba diver has um, been caught out with this one, and it's a criminal offence that the exact wording is touching or possessing ornamental fish without permission. And so this diver, back in September 2020, um, had been in a marine protected area, and they were charged with intruding in an area designated for environmental protection and branded a social threat by the Immigration Bureau before they were deported out of the country. And they had previously been fined for immigration violations uncovered during the investigation, but they were later allowed back into Thailand following an appeal to the Immigration Bureau that they had to care for a uh, grandmother living in the country. And now, two years later, um, the diver has just been charged again, according to Thai News, on the basis of video footage that he posted on YouTube showing him allegedly touching a, uh, a pipefish. And from the screen capture that, uh, that I can see, it looks like he's in relatively open water with his, his hand out just kind of in front of him, uh, not outstretched. And there's a, a pipefish in um, like pretty much mid-water. But of course, yeah, he's, he's making contact with this fish, which is a crime. Um, so he's basically been demanded to, uh, to come into a local um, police station. Um, and he kind of denies this, says that, oh, no, it's, um, it had been taken a very long time ago, but yeah, he's been asked to return with evidence and witnesses to support his claim of innocence, and Thailand's Department of Marine and Coastal Resources issued an appeal to any diver seeing this kind of behaviour to call a hotline and to follow the department's regulations. Do not touch only look with your eyes, they state. Uh, don't take anything back except photographs and memories. Help the ecosystem under the sea in Thailand to remain sustainable forever. So yeah, even if the fish comes up to you, uh, don't touch it. And especially don't record yourself touching it. Um, because yeah, they will they will find it and, uh, and they will charge you. So um, yeah, if you're diving in those kind of areas, yeah, just keep your hands to yourself and um, yeah. 
don't touch anything. Uh, the final news story that caught my eye was uh, is quite an interesting one, and it's that hammerheads effectively hold their breath. So hammerhead sharks, because they dive down very, very deep for, uh, for hunting purposes and whatnot, um, scientists have been studying them to kind of work out a, what they do down there, and B, how they kind of survive down there because of the temperature drop. Um, and they say that hammerhead sharks can stay warm even when diving to these extreme depths by performing the equivalent of marine mammals' breath holds. So they're kind of like free divers. Even though they can breathe down there, they don't want to breathe in the cold water because it's going to, cold, uh, it's going to chill their body down. So this is a previously unobserved behavior, and it's not confirmed as such. It's a matter of they've seen it, but they, of course, have to uh, like replicate and, uh, and double check it. Um, but yeah, scientists now believe the sharks effectively hold their breath by closing their gill slits at critical moments. So they regularly dive to mesopelagic depths, which is between 200 and 1,000 meters in the open ocean. Uh, and because these vertical movements typically begin and end in shallow waters, they're commonly referred to as dives, just like our ones, uh, even though these fishes are not compelled to return to the ocean's surface to breathe, unlike marine mammals, reptiles, and birds. Um, and that was a quote from Mark Royer of the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, the University of Hawaii. Um, but the parallels between animals that breathe using lungs and gills are no coincidence. They, um, they say that after concluding that tropical scalloped hammerhead sharks just free dive and um, the body temperature they, they think it's mainly down to the body temperature because of course they can still breathe down there uh, it's just yeah you have to maintain that body temperature to like move effectively and it's the body temperature of most fish which is heavily regulated by their environment and this presents the challenge for these large predators that need to maintain a certain temperature to fully function they need to keep their body warm to move around effectively but when they venture down into that different thermal environment in search of prey, if they just like normally dive down and they were breathing the whole way down, it would chill their body down and their muscles wouldn't move as quickly. Using state-of-the-art remote biologgers, they found that the hammerheads were able to maintain a warmer body temperature during dives beyond 800 meters simply by closing their gill slits. And the scientists believe that suppressing this gill function, uh, convective heat transfer is suspended. And functionally, these sharks hold their breath during dives to facilitate access to prey in deep, cold waters. The adult sharks were studied and they dived rapidly and repeatedly from surface waters around 26 degrees Celsius and then dived down beyond 800 meters where the water temperature was as low as five degrees Celsius, but maintaining muscle and heart temperatures throughout, significant and rapid cooling only occurred during the later stages of the ascent phase. So they basically hold their breath, dive down, do their hunting, come back up, and on the way back up, start to like, breathe again and that's when their body would start to uh, to cool down and one of the interesting things was rov video footage of one of the hammerheads swimming at below 1000 meters off of tanzania showed that it appeared to have its gill slits closed whereas videos in surface waters showed the slits open but of course yeah further researchers need to uh, to put theory beyond all doubt um so yeah now the the scientists are looking to attach cameras to the shark's pectoral fins just pointed at their gill slits to um to, to work out if this is actually what they do and um yeah that's just interesting i always knew that hammerhead sharks spend a lot of time in deep deep waters but it never really occurred to me that yeah you know what it's really cold down there and they need to maintain body heat so that their muscles move and that's probably one way that they do it. I saw another uh, article years ago now about great white sharks and how they can kind of create their own body heat. I can't remember if they're 
basically warm blooded, but they were basically saying that you know yeah they can. I forget how it has been a few years since I uh, since I read it, but they can kind of create their own uh, own body heat to survive in uh, in colder waters, which was interesting. And uh, yeah, hammerheads seem to um, hold their breath underwater, uh, which is quite fascinating to uh, to think about. Now, as I mentioned at the uh, the start of the podcast, is uh, is sponsored by the scuba diving giant Scuba Pro, uh, who have been making great scuba diving equipment since 1963 i've been using them for uh, for years i used to teach in uh, in scuba pro bcds you used to use their regulators they're tough they're reliable and they make everything from mask snorkels and fins to wetsuits dry suits dive computers uh, that they make a little bit of everything they're a, a, a wonderful wide range um, scuba diving company and they they do make a great range of diving products and one interesting thing about the Scoopro range is that divers just continue to buy the classics. So, I mean, the jet fins from back in like 1965, I think they came out with, divers still still demand that they continue to uh, to make them. I saw today, it was actually this morning as I was researching the podcast, they've actually released a new version of the Twin Jet Fin, the Twin Jet 2 Fin. Uh, so they've just upgraded it a little bit. Um, but yeah, the, these are fins from yeah back in the 60s and 70s and whatnot. Uh, but they're still making them because divers still want them and they um they just have to tweak them to um to just change with the time so like the uh, the jet fin now comes with spring heel straps because that's a relatively modern take most new diving fins have spring heel straps so they put them on the jet fins and people still buy them because they simply work you have that and then you have the the cutting edge stuff like the sea wing nova and the supernova um so yeah scuba pro just covers the entire range of diving equipment uh it's just incredible incredible stuff and a lot of modern technology you look at their hydros pro bcd using monoprene so the same material from their fins as a um uh, as a as a backplate and harness system, which makes sense. It, it means it dries instantly. It's very tough. It's quite grippy. So once you put it on, your BCD stays in place, which is exactly what you want from your BCD. Um, and it comes in different colors. So yeah, just interesting stuff. And right now, Scuba Pro has a pair of offers at participating dealers. Um, so the first one is a free Octo offer. So this is on quite a wide range of their regulators if you buy the uh, the screw pro s620 ti or the d420 with the mark 19 or the mark 25 you'll get an s270 octo free um, and if you get the s600 or the g260 um, so that's either the regular g260 or the new carbon black tech then you'll get an r105 octo for free um, so yeah head over to your uh, your local scuba pro dealer to uh, to check that out that's a really good way to um, to get a nice set of regulators and yeah you're getting a free octo so you're saving yourself some money and also even though it's getting warm outside I'm still in my dry suit. So the second offer is a dry suit promotion on Scuba Pro dry suits. Uh, so if you buy one of their neoprene dry suits, so the EverDry 4 or the Exo Dry, you can get a free K2 light undersuit set, uh, which is more like a, a base layer because underneath a neoprene dry suit, you don't need a thick, heavy undersuit. The, um, the neoprene itself is insulated uh, or you can get the k2 medium thickness undersuit which is for colder waters uh, so when you pair it with the everdrive 4 that will do like autumn winter diving as well uh, you can get that for just 99 pounds uh, so you're saving yourself the best part of 200 quid um, or if you prefer a trilaminate dry suit they have the Evertech Breathable or the Definition Dry dry suits. Uh, and if you buy one of those at a participating dealer, you get the K2 Extreme undersuit for free. Uh, so that's a full body undersuit and it has this... Um, Clever system where extra padding in key areas to prevent heat loss. Um, so yeah, just a great way to get into dry suits. And um, yeah, both of these offers are running up until the end of July this year in certain regions. And of course, participating dealers also. So just 
double check. Uh, they might not have it all in stock, but there's um, there's quite often like a form that you that you fill out, and then they'll uh, they'll get it in for you. Um, but yeah, I'll put links down in the uh, in the description below so that you can check them out. Otherwise, it's uh, it's Scubapro dot johnson outdoors dot com and um, yeah you can read up about their latest offers and that's it this week uh, because this is already getting on for quite a long podcast with that uh, that first news story um, but the, um, the just one one little thing at the end just to um, just to tide you over is that Paddy has come up with a new hand signal um, which is to signal that you are ill that you're not feeling well underwater. Uh, so it's basically, if you take your hand, put it out in front of you, and kind of bend your fingers all together at 90 degrees to your palm, and then point it at yourself, and then draw an oval kind of around your face and around your tummy. Uh, when you draw that circle, it basically means, I don't feel well. It's different from the like shaking your hands from side to side. It's uh, it's a new hand signal, and uh, they're they're calling it a game changer in a situation where every second counts. It's a simple signal where you draw a big oval in front of your head and torso with your fingers pointing towards you. Having a prearranged communication plan with your buddy is crucial, but without a specific signal for illness, it can be difficult to convey what's wrong. Um, Normally, I if I'm not feeling well, I just give the something wrong, shaking your hand, and then point at my stomach, um, and that would convey the uh, the same message. However, yeah, it, it's a new a new signal, and um, yeah, if you see it, someone drawing like a big circle with a, um, a like with their hand pointing towards them, it, it basically means they don't feel well. Um, so you probably want to. Uh, join them on the surface to uh, to make sure that they're okay and make sure that they're um personally i'd probably get hold of my uh, my alternate air source to uh, to give it to them just in case they throw up in their uh, their second stage and they don't know how to clear it or they can't clear it just be ready to like deliver some gas just in case but yeah big signal around your uh, like head and torso just means i don't feel so good um but yeah that's um I thought that was quite interesting and a, uh, an interesting way to uh, to end the podcast. Uh, but yeah, that's it for this week. Uh, I'm not going to drag it out any longer. Uh, remember to head over to our website, scubadivermag.com, and of course, Scuba Pro and their, uh, their amazing offers at the moment. Um, thank you for listening, everybody, and of course, safe diving.